this presentation, um, it was it was made by Cancer Support Community, so this isn't isn't my presentation. They they built it, and then I I made some changes to it just to help make it my own. But the biggest thing is that it's going to embody Cancer Support Community's um, mission, and so you can see that there. Um, like I said, I didn't develop this. It's a lot of the research comes from Cancer Support Community, and they get the final say on if they'll share this with you and stuff, but you, of course, this is being recorded, so you can watch it later. Um, I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. They're not paying me to say all of this or to make them sound good. This is all my own, my own doing. So here is the overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So again, like I said, this presentation is built off of some of the foundations of Cancer Support Community's mission statement, which is to empower you by knowledge, strengthened by action, and sustained by community. So we're going to talk about each of these um, tonight and hopefully give you some, some tidbits to, um, to have that action. So worldwide, there's about 19.3 million new cancer cases a year. And so what's different, why, why I think this is important is because there's, that means there's 19.3 million unique experiences with cancer going on because cancer, while medically there's a structure to that and how people respond to treatment and all of that, when you really boil it down, the mental, emotional, spiritual, all of those things is so unique to every person, just like a thumbprint. So I think this is why this conversation we're going to be having tonight is even more important because what's going to work for one person during their treatment or even after is, is not going to work um, for somebody else. So hopefully we'll be able to build that for yourself. So there's going to be a lot of information. So take a breath and don't feel like, you know, you're in class and have to write every word down. You're always welcome to reach out to Hunter or other people at Cancer Support Community to get more of this information. So we'll start first with the empowering you by knowledge. How do you get prepared um, after being diagnosed with cancer? So here are some just basic sort of 10 actions that you can take. And, and we'll go through some of these um, more in depth, but just on the high level, the first thing is just gathering information about your diagnosis. That includes what even kind of cancer in it is it? What's the staging? Um, or what about um, any genetic markers that they've done? Or, or tumor markers, or just any kind of test they've ever run um, about your diagnosis. Number two is learning the basics. This could be just basic terminology. Um, oncology, they like to use a lot of really big words, and it's even working in oncology for going on like seven or eight years now, I can't even read some of the doctor's things and know what I'm talking about. So this can be a simple, a simple Google search on, on certain words that you're not sure what Number three, we'll definitely talk about this one later, is writing down questions and concerns. You should always, always, always write down questions, especially before any appointments or any time that you're going to see your oncologist or a nurse practitioner or somebody. Don't tell yourself you'll remember because you won't. You absolutely won't. There's just too much going on that you'll forget. So maybe even in your phone, you keep a little notepad to where you can type it in really quick and then write it down later, or you keep a little journal with you. This is one of the biggest ones. Number four, bring someone with you. Never go to an appointment by yourself if you can. There's a lot of information and two heads are always better than one to figure out what's going on. And it can be really overwhelming for you. Plus during treatments, you're really tired. And so you may not be you know, all cognitively on your game too. So you wanna have someone there to help. Number five, learning about your treatment options and goals of care. We'll talk about this in depth um, a little bit later, so I'll skip that one. Um, same with number six, ask about the risks and the benefits of treatments. We'll talk about that more in depth. Number seven, talk to your doctor about your treatment decisions. Again, those kind of all go together, so we'll talk about that. Um, number eight, getting a second opinion. This is, I think, not really controversial, but people think it is, so we'll talk about that one in depth as well clinical trials, and then talking to someone about your emotions. Obviously, the therapist is going to talk to you about that this evening. So more on gathering information. Again, what is my diagnosis? What type of cancer do I have? Is it breast cancer? Is it colon cancer? And then what's the stage? Typically, um, they're all different, and I don't know them all, but typically you hear stage one to stage four. Um, I think there is a stage zero. 
um, in like breast cancer. And then I know with breast cancer as well, there's like stage 2B and it can get very complicated. So having some documentation to know exactly what that is. As I said too, what have been some of the tests they've, they've run? Have they done MRIs, CAT scans, any other sort of blood test, genetic testing, any genomic or biomarker testing? Just have all of that information compiled one, just in case, just for your own records, or two, who knows, you may move across the country. And so when you get with a new oncologist, you want to be able to give them all of that information so they, they can step right in and continue your treatments. Part of learning the basics is knowing who is on my team. So here's a list of people that could be on your oncology team. So of course you have your oncologist. Um, and your oncology nurse, who honestly your nurse you're going to see the most, they're the ones that give you the treatments and give you medications and things like that. They don't prescribe medications, but they will give it to you when you are um, there for treatment. Um, typically only your oncologist or more likely your advanced practice um, providers like a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant um, will be doing a lot of that. Um, a palliative care team. So this is palliative care is basically comfort care. So if you're having any significant side effects from treatment, um, even if you're having some depression, anxiety from treatment, this is, you'll probably have a palliative care team. They're able to keep a closer eye on you and meet with you on a more regular basis, whereas the oncologist, you know, only sees you during treatments and things like that. And they'll prescribe all those medications and be able to monitor you very closely. Um, the next one, uh, your navigator, this is probably the most important person that you need to have their number on speed dial. Um, this could be a nurse navigator, a, a social work navigator, a patient navigator, but this is basically your, this person is your hub. So if you have any questions about resources or questions about what the doctor said, or you're having issues with insurance or you're having issues with what whatever it is, your navigator is going to be the first person you really want to go to because they're able to then talk to some of these other people like your oncologist or the oncology nurses or some of the other people that we'll talk about to make sure that your question gets answered and your problem gets fixed. So if you don't take anything from this slide, know who your navigator is and have their information. A financial counselor, so we'll talk a little bit more about finances later. Um, but a financial counselor can, again, help you with um, cost of either prescriptions or help you with insurance stuff, finding grants or other coverages for, for treatments. You also have maybe an oncology social worker, other psychosocial support, someone like myself who I'm not, I'm not a social worker, I'm a therapist, um, but someone who's maybe helping on more the mental health side that you're going to counseling or maybe a support group um, or a peer support group. You have your genetic counselor. Almost, I think everybody who's diagnosed with cancer goes through genetic counseling. Um, and so they're, they're basically going to look at what are your genetic markers that put you at a higher risk for cancer. And then also we'll test some of your immediate family as well. Typically when we're diagnosed with cancer um, and you have an immediate family member like a child or a parent, it, it ups the um, age for you to when you need to get tested. Um, you'll probably also meet with a registered dietitian, and so they're going to make sure that um, your weight and your, your physical health is maintained as far as nutrition during treatments, because that can definitely be affected. One that's not on here, I realize, is also like a radiation um, oncologist, so if you have to do any radiation, you're probably going to meet, more likely to meet the dietitian during um, radiation, but could still um, with chemotherapy. You may have a chaplain or another spiritual support advisor. And then lastly, um, rehabilitation therapists who um, are going to help you with kind of that day-to-day -day, um, changes that you may experience through side effects, fatigue, mobility issues, and things like that. So this probably isn't everybody. You may have some other people on your team. You may have um, to go see some other specialists. I know sometimes they want you to see um, like cardio oncology for some of the treatments. So it can help to keep a list of these people too, because you're going to meet a lot of people. Something that's really important in oncology that I don't think is always talked about, and I think is a bigger movement in the medical field today, is that a lot of things, they want to be shared decision-making. So what that means is 
it's not just the doctor making the decision. Yes, they know all about treatments and they know all about what you need medication wise. However, they don't always know what your values and your goals and what's important in your life. So we will talk about this a little more in depth later, but just as an example, you, let's say they give you treatment A that says, okay, you'll get 10 years with treatment A, but your quality of life will be really terrible for eight of those. And we've got treatment B, which might give you six years and that whole six years, you'll be great. Well, it's, that's for some people, they're going to take, they're going to take treatment A because they, they want to live the longest. Whereas team B, they, they want more of that quality of life. So that's where just one example of this, this is important. And so that's, that's kind of an extreme example, even down to medications. If they say, you know, this side effect to this medication is weight gain. And you're like, I'm, I'm already struggling with that. Having that conversation and trying to come to that shared decision with, with your team. And so as far as treatment, that is knowing like, what are the goals of this treatment? And, and this is you asking the oncologist, what, what is the goal with your treatment? Are you are you trying to cure me? Is it just extending my life? What, what's going on here? What are other options? Why are you picking this treatment specifically? Is there someone able to help me with any side effects or things that come up? There can be a lot of questions um, that you want to ask about that. So you're more than welcome to ask these questions. I think the medical model used to be you go to the doctor, you do what the doctor said, and you didn't question it. But it's becoming a lot more acceptable for you to not question it in like a mean way, but to really ask like, why? Why is this what you're picking for me? Because again, you're not, I think doctors sometimes forget that they're treating people and not cancer, right? And so we really need to be asking those questions so that we're prioritized. Second opinion. So like I said, I think people think this is a little controversial and it's really not. Second opinions are almost always encouraged in oncology. Um, it's treatment for oncology is very nuanced. There, there really isn't just one treatment that says, oh, you have breast cancer. This is what you get. Um, there are some things to consider though. So one, insurance typically will provide a second opinion. Uh, you definitely need to call and double check because insurance can be funny sometimes. You need to talk to your current medical team who has who gave you your first opinion. And in my opinion, if they are, uh, let's say, I want to say good, but I'll say effective healthcare workers, they will not get mad or upset. Um, personally, I think if I asked for a second opinion and my doctor got mad at me, that might be a red flag for me. Uh, but for other people, that may be different. Make sure that when you do, if you do have a second opinion, that your doctor, that that team has everything that you've already done. So any testing, reports, biopsies, surgeries, procedures, discharge summaries from appointments, inpatient stays, treatment plan from Dr. One, all of that stuff. Make sure that you have that so they can look that over as well. So if the opinions are different, if they're not the same, which this I think actually is quite rare, but if so, you can, there's a couple of things you can do. You can contact the first doctor and you can talk with them and say, okay, so-and-so is recommending this. What do you think about that? You can also do some of your own research on reputable, reputable websites um, to see what would, what would be the standard of care, which just means what's kind of the basic standard that everybody um, gets with treatment with this cancer. Um, and you can even seek a third opinion. Um, the biggest thing, again, is when you're asking questions and getting these opinions is, why are you picking this treatment for me? You know, how is this uh, treatment going to benefit me? Of course, it's going to treat my cancer, but how about me as a person? Um, and one thing I didn't mention is that some, a lot of, um, Hospital systems have like second opinion clinics. Like I know Franciscan had one for lung cancer um, when I was there. I don't know if community have one. I'm sure they do, but, but a lot of them do. So this is not something that's like common. Another thing that a lot of people don't know about are clinical trials. So people think that clinical trials um, are one for like advanced disease or like people who like their, their treatments aren't working and so they need something new. Um, and not at all. There's clinical trials for all steps of um, cancer care. So from newly diagnosed to I've had cancer for 20 years kind of thing. Um, 
you will never be given a placebo. That is not how these clinical trial, trials work. People think that like they may be given a fake treatment that is completely unethical and illegal and against like tons of human rights. So what most clinical trials are, at least when it comes to treatment, is one group is getting this current standard of care. So what, what is considered the standard of care for that treatment or for that cancer? And then another group is going to get the standard plus whatever they're researching, the new medic, the new, the new treatment. So not you're not going to go with, they're not going to give you a water pill and tell you that it's treating your cancer. Clinical trials are also really good because it's where you get some of the best care. You are monitored very closely. You have weekly, if not more than weekly appointments. They're always checking in on you, asking if you have side effects, if you're having anything going on, because it's, this is research that they're doing. So you are very much closely monitored. Um, it, you can talk to your doctor or again, your navigator if you are interested in seeing what clinical trials may be available for your type of cancer. You can also search them. They are public information. Um, the only thing is that if it's not perhaps within the, the hospital system you're being treated, they may ask you to move your treatment to their hospital. Um, some will even give you money if you have to travel um, or will give you lodging and things like that if it's really far, um, though not always. So it can be, it can be a good thing to look so let's talk about health insurance. Definitely not my forte, so I won't spend too much, but I think it is really important because cancer is expensive. And a lot of people, I think, don't always know that. Um, the slide here says that one out of 10 people postpone filling prescriptions due to cost. And while that seems like a low number, that it should be zero out of 10. And, and I know working in mental health, I've had patients who do the same thing. And these are really important medications. So it's important that you get to know your insurance and what is your coverage because financial toxicity, which is the immense financial stress that comes from cancer care, is very real. And again, the um, picture says that seven out of 10 people were said that no one talked to them about the cost of their care. And I, I would say that's absolutely true. So making sure that if cost is a concern, maybe you um, contact your navigator, you find a referral to one of the financial navigators. I think all the cancer centers have those so that they can help you with that. Um, let's skip over that. Let's go now to more about values, goals, wishes, and why this is so important. Again, this, this medical model is changing in that no longer is it, you're, you know, you're the patient and you do what I say. It's very much this shared decision making and that requires you to one know what are your goals and your priorities and values and needs and i think what's hard about this and why we're talking about this with newly diagnosed is that these things change when you when you get a cancer diagnosis um so the things that you once thought were really important really aren't maybe that 80 hour a week job is really kind of dumb after you now have cancer because you want to go out and you want to live life so there may be a lot of things that you have to consider as far as those changes before you're able to talk about them with your healthcare team. And your doctor, working in healthcare, I, I don't know how to say this, but we're busy. Healthcare is a very overburdened system right now. And so they want to help you. They have limited time. They have limited resources. And so part of your responsibility as a patient is telling them this information because unfortunately they can't read your mind. So telling them, hey, I have this really important thing that I need to make sure I get to. Maybe it's, I don't know, my son's wedding or my 50th wedding anniversary or something, right? Like those things. Um, it seems silly to tell your doctor that, again, because that's not really what the model's been. Um, but it, it is. It is really important for them to know that. And again, I think effective healthcare workers are going to care about that and, and really consider how they can pick the best treatments for you. I think from a therapy standpoint, I work a lot with values and commitments, um, or what I call values and commitments. And so I think why I love working in oncology so much is because people really start to solidify what those values are. So let's, let's for example, just say that um, I'll take exercise as an example. That's a really good one. People will say, I want to be healthy, which is technically a goal. But what happens is we then set ourselves up where we say, I want to be healthy, so I'm going to go to the gym five days a week. 
okay, sounds reasonable. People who are healthy go to the gym and work out five days a week. But what happens is then when you go four days or you go three days, we recognize that as a failure because you've set up the equation of healthy equals five days at the gym. So four days at the gym can't. So what we want to do and why this is important to talk about values is we instead focus on maybe I value my health. And so then we would say I commit to my health by fill in the blank. So there's, there's many different reasons this is important. One, it helps you to come up with some of those other things that add up to health, right? Health is not just exercise. Maybe you're ready to um, start cooking at home more and you want to stop going out to eat. Maybe you want to try a new yoga class. Maybe you park out a little further from the grocery store or you walk up and down every aisle. It, it, this equation helps you define what am I really ready for by using that word commitment. Because if you say I value my health and I commit to my health by going to the gym five days a week, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty terrible. Some of you may think that sounds great, but it's so different, right? It's so different. And again, with the cancer experience, it's so different for everybody. So I think that's why it's really important for us to know what those values are, again, because they change. Have there been any questions so far? I can't see the chat or anything, or if anyone has any, they feel like they want to ask right now. I haven't had any in the chat so far. Okay. So good time to take a moment to think about what are my goals? What are my values? What are the things that I still want to want to achieve, even though I'm going through treatment right now? So you can see, too, that there's a lot of different categories that come to goals, right? It could be your physical health. It could be relationships, maybe work or school, community involvement, or anything else. So now let's move to more of the action part. So specifically, how do you tell people about your new diagnosis? So a, a close to half of patients were at least moderately concerned about changes to work, school, or home life. And I would dare say this number is far higher because again, cancer doesn't just affect your health. It affects maybe your work, it affects your relationships, it affects even just maybe how you see the world. And what's important to realize, too, is that while patients were, we're experiencing physical changes as well as everything else, people in our, our circle are also experiencing um, cancer as well, just not on the, on the physical level. And so there's no, again, there's no normal way to feel after, um, to feel after cancer. It could be many different things. It could be sad. It could be anger. It could be everything under the sun. Um, so the, it's really common to worry about all these things. And that uncontrolled worry, though, can become, you know, anxiety and depression and things that we really want to watch out for. So how do we prepare? So the first thing, other than talking about, you know, treatment options, all of those things that we've talked about, um, who do I tell in maybe my personal life? So the biggest thing I would suggest for you to consider is who do you want to tell that's going to be supportive? And remember that this is this is your boat. Like you are the captain of the ship. So you don't have to feel pressure to tell anybody based on societal pressures or family pressure or any kind of pressure. If there's someone, let's say you don't want to tell a parent, you really you don't have to if you don't think they're going to be supportive. Um, now we'll talk about how sometimes just logistics, you have to tell certain people, but the biggest thing to start off is who do you want to tell and who is going to be supportive? So make a list of, of who that is. How do you want to tell them? Um, when do you want to tell them? This could be, um, you know, are, are you going to call them? Are you going to meet with, with them for lunch? Are you going to invite them over? Are you going to tell multiple people at once, you know, maybe you're going to tell both of your parents or you're going to tell all of your kids, or I think having that plan really helps you to focus on that. And, and I think that makes it easier too, trying to tell multiple people at once. You don't want to have to keep going around and telling individual people and telling this story 45 times. That's, that's not really fun. So if you need to tell multiple people like a family meeting or something, you can also, this is a great way to use social media to your advantage. Um, if you feel comfortable doing that. The biggest thing to remember is that 
not a, you're not just telling people one time, you're going to be updating people about your treatments and if you have surgeries and things like that. They're, they're going to want to know. So think about that as well. That can be really taxing to sit and text, you know, 45 people after you've just had treatment and you're tired and you just want to go to bed. So think about even what does that look like? Maybe you have a friend or a spouse who's a designated person that's going to tell everybody and you give them the list and kind of create like a like a phone tree or something. Um, or again, social media is a great way um, to do this as well. Another thing to realize as you start doing this is that people are going to ask how they can support you. How can I help you? And our tendency is to say, oh, I'm okay. And I think it's important to maybe come up with some things that you really do need help with or you think you're going to need help with, which can be hard initially when you've been newly diagnosed. Um, because people who ask this generally do want to help you. So give them something, even if it's as silly as like, you know, I, I really want a Diet Coke from the gas station. That's fine. They'll feel really helpful being able to do that for you. But ask for the bigger things too. Ask for them to get your groceries. Ask them to help you clean your house. Ask them to run other errands for you. Because otherwise you're going to end up with 45 lasagnas in the fridge because that's what people tend to do is they tend to make you food. So lasagna is good, but 45 of them probably not so great. Um, so again, you, you're driving this boat. You, you tell people what you need. So like I said, even though you're driving the boat, there may be some practical um, things that you have to think about because even if you don't want to tell certain people, it, it's probably going to come up, right? A big one that we'll talk about later is like work. It's hard to not tell people at work because maybe you have to leave work a lot. Um, so not that you tell everyone at work, but um, people who um, are, are affected by your cancer, obviously on a personal level, are going to need to know um, anyone that needs explain what's going on with you, um, anyone that you want to share your emotional experience with or might need help, uh, day to day help with, they, they may need to know. Even on that front, though, you don't have to tell them everything. You don't have to tell them every nitty gritty piece. And people may not like that, and that's their problem. They can go to therapy about it. That's what I say. It's not your, it's not your responsibility to deal with their, with their frustration. Let's talk a little bit about how do you tell kids? I don't know if anyone here um, has um, kids, either like young kids or adult kids. Um, so I'll kind of blow through this. And if we have more questions about it, you can ask. Um, strong majority of parents said that their kids do not openly um, talk to them or share their feelings about cancer. One, I'll say this is actually quite common. Kids, one, don't tell their parents everything. And I'm sure many of you here who have parents don't tell them everything. I, I get along with my parents. I sure don't tell them everything, um, even as an adult now, because you just don't do that. You just don't tell them everything. So part of that is common, in this, but especially in oncology or in cancer, they, they're going to have a hard time talking to you about this. There's a lot of mixed feelings that go along with it. So specifically talking about young kids and teenagers, you, again, want to prepare yourself for talking to them. So thinking of any questions or just knowing your child, like, how do I think they're going to react and kind of be ready for that? Um, there are lots of, there are lots of books um, that are helpful, not, not like self-help books, but like for the younger kiddos, um, that can be, that can be really helpful for this. Um, be aware of their feelings that come up during that conversation that you have with them. Let them know that if they have any questions or they have any worries that they can always come and talk to you. I would call this planting the seed. They, they may need time to process it, just like anybody else in your life may need some time. The big thing I try to tell to adults is that like kids are still people. They still have reactions to things. The issue is that kids don't have the emotional vocabulary or emotional understanding to conceptualize or rationalize it like we can, right? Like we can say like, oh, I got cancer. That really sucks. That's really scary. Blah, 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 blah. Kids can't do that. They just get all the feels and none of the understanding. So they, they may need a lot of time to process that, but planting that seed of, hey, when you have a question, come and talk to me. Um, and number four, which you would think this is no brainer, but I have to say it, plan time for that conversation. Don't do it right before like, you know, 
Sarah's birthday party next door. Like, don't don't make sure you have time to sit down in case they have lots of questions or they have lots of emotions. Um, it's going to be difficult. I don't have any. I don't have any nuggets of wisdom for you for this to be easy. It definitely will not will not be an easy conversation. Um, and and you can say that. You can own up to that and say this is really hard. You know, and um, we're gonna but we're gonna get through this. So some things that maybe specifically you can talk with them about are expectations. The biggest thing to think about is um, age. So kids about 10 and under, you can't be as direct. You have to you have to kind of tiptoe around things, but not in a way that you're like lying to them or not telling them the truth. The example that comes to mind is, and this has nothing to do with cancer necessarily, but um, dealing with grief with kids. Don't, don't tell kids like grandma's sleeping or anything like that, right? Because kids think, oh, she's sleeping, she'll wake up. That, that's very confusing. Kids um, under the age of 10, they don't understand the finality of things. So like when you say like grandma's dead, they don't, they don't get that. So same thing with cancer. When you say I have cancer and I'm going to have it for a long time, they don't quite get that. So you may say things like, you know, I'm, I'm really sick and I have to go to the hospital a lot. And then that will make me better. Um, you have to think of the language and the vocabulary for them. Now, about 10 and up from there, you can be more direct. You can talk about cancer. You can talk about treatments. Again, not the nitty gritty details of it, but you can, you can do that. Um, biggest thing with little kids is more of like education, letting them know that they didn't they didn't do this. There was nothing that they did. Can kids, uh, little kids especially, tend to be very egocentric, very uh, world revolves around me. And so anytime something bad happens, they think it's their fault. So just reminding them that, that it's not um, and that they didn't do anything to cause cancer, that they're not going to get cancer either. Um, it's not something that they can catch. And then also just letting them know it's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel sad. And we're going to be here for you and you are loved and you are cared for. Um, and we're going to keep a routine as best we can, making sure that they still get to do any extracurricular activities, hang out with their friends, things like that. So always make sure no matter the age that you're very clear, very honest, dispel any of those myths that may come up. Um, don't lie to them again, but don't feel like you have to share everything. There can definitely be a um, if they don't feel comfortable necessarily talking to a parent, kind of maybe talk to them about, well, who do you want to talk to? Do you, you know, want to talk to, um, you know, Aunt Becky or uh, your coach at school or let them know that there, there's definitely support for them if they ever do want to talk to someone other than you. And again, always leave that door open that I'm, I'm here for you or whatever you need. May take some reminding them, but they will, they will. So the biggest thing after having that conversation, try to keep their routine and rules as best you as best you can. Um, if they need some space to process those feelings, let them do that in, in a safe way, of course. Um, find some support for them if need be, and um, find other ways to maybe to maybe help them, whether that's um, through like support groups or or peer groups, um, things like that. And just some red flags to watch for um, with kids. Um, extreme behavioral changes. So if you go from, you know, a, a sweet, calm child to throwing tantrums every 30 minutes, that that would be um, a red flag. Um, any extreme isolation. So maybe they don't want to go hang out with their friends anymore. Um, they maybe don't want to go like if they're involved in sports or band or something, they don't want to do that. Um, and, and that can be kind of normal at first, but if it continues to persist and is happening more and more and more, that's where it definitely becomes a red flag. Um, any trouble at school, any behavioral troubles, as well as if their grades start slipping, that's always a big one as well. Um, we talked about not engaging activities, um, either, either with family or outside of the family. And then of course, if they ever express a desire to hurt themselves or others, even if you think it's just attention seeking, still take it seriously because kids, especially teenagers are very impulsive. And so you can get into a, a situation where you any questions that have come up? Now we're going to talk about work. None so far. You're good. Okay. 
So for anyone that is diagnosed why they are still working, um, which a lot of people are, this is around 40%. Again, I think this is probably a smidge higher um, of newly diagnosed people are of working age. And of that, 80% typically return back to, to their work. So where do you start if this is something that you are concerned about? So the first thing is to know what are my legal rights? A lot of the times, um, cancer centers can help you with this, but there are tons and tons of um, organizations out there that can also help. The biggest thing to realize is that cancer is covered as a protected um, disability, essentially, from the Americans with, a dis with the Disability Act. So Legally, you cannot be fired for getting cancer. Now, employers can be tricky um, and not always supportive. So making sure that you contact like your HR department and you know what are my benefits. Um, we'll talk about like maybe if you need to sign up for um, FMLA or family medical leave for appointments if you're going to be gone a lot. Um, understanding maybe how can your job change? Do you have a job where maybe you can work from home a little bit more, have a flexible schedule. Um, that's going to allow you to conserve your energy, any schedule changings with treatments, things like that. So creating that plan for yourself, knowing your benefits, like I said, what's your sick time? Do you have any kind of disability set up or can you get that set up? And then if this is something, like I said, a lot of organizations are out there, Cancer and Careers, which is on this side, is um, one of the best, they have lost, they have a huge sort of, um, I want to say not legal team, but it, it, it's a bunch of people who are knowledgeable about the laws and what can employers do and not do. Um, and then there's a couple other um, on here that I've, I've not heard of, but I'm sure are important as well. And, and Cancer and Careers, I know they have lots of information on their website too that can help you. So, so now creating more of that community part, creating that team. So now not, not so much your, your medical team now, um, but now having that support. And I think specifically what we'll get into is for any caregivers or if you have any caregivers in your life, people who are helping you through this, it's very important for caregivers to have just as much support um, as the patient. So making sure that caregivers are letting friends and family know what you need and making sure that you're setting aside that time to just be with friends and family and finding your own support, whether it's a group or a counseling or some sort of online discussion board um, and making sure that your healthcare providers are informed as well as, as a caregiver. So making sure that your role as a caregiver, you're there to support, right? You're there to listen, um, to take time to understand what they want, you're kind of that go between as far as the between like your loved one and maybe the oncology team, um, or maybe even other people in in your life as well. Um, so how do you support them? How do you help them? It's, it's a hard role to navigate because um, I don't know. We, we can be stubborn sometimes, you know, as patients, and so our carriers there to kind of swiftly, uh, not swiftly, but nudge us in the right in the right direction sometimes or advocate for us too because sometimes we do have to do that. Um, this is from um, a, a caregiver. They say my caregiver mantra is to remember the only control you have is over the changes you choose to make. And we'll talk about control a little bit later um, as far as control within ourselves. But more about caregivers. So again, from the Cancer Experience Registry, Nearly 100% said they provide emotional support for their loved one. Um, they say they went to their loved one uh, with their loved one to medical appointments, help with decision making, coordinated medical care, provided transportation, and helped manage finances. So areas are, are very important. I mean, they are there at each step of the way with us. So whether this is, <coughs> excuse me, a spouse or um, a sibling or a parent or a child or even a friend. Um, they can really be a big advocate for us. So it's important that they're taken care of. Here's all the things they do. Um, I won't read this to you, but they, they, wear, they wear a lot of hats sometimes. So 
um, this this slide when I was looking at it made, it made me laugh because um, I was talking to a, a patient of mine this week who is a caregiver for her sister, not, not for cancer, it's for um, some other chronic health issues. And so specifically, we were talking about the enjoyment of the role. She was saying how stressful it is. She said, but I would do it a million times over. And she was so mad because they were talking to, I can't remember who it was. It was someone with like Medicaid or something. And they said, we have this program that you can sign up for and you, you'll you'll get paid. We'll give you money to be her caregiver. And she was so mad. She was like, how dare they think that I would do this for money? And I was kind of like, yeah, also let's take some free money. Like use it for whatever, like go to the casino. It doesn't matter. Um, but I think it's funny because a lot of caregivers say this, they, they don't, they don't do it because it's fun or for the recognition or because they're going to get paid for it. They do it because they love the person, you know, and they want to be able to have that pride and that purpose to be helpful during our treatments. They they want to be in that role and they want to help advocate for you as well. So sometimes I think as patients, that's really nice to remember that they are there to help you, even if sometimes they don't seem like it and, and have that conversation to say, hey, I know you're trying to advocate for me, but what you're doing is not working. So let's figure out how we can make it. So these are the top 10 tips for caregivers. So we've talked about a lot of them already that um, had to do with us as patients. I think the first one is, of course, finding your own support system. Um, a lot of caregivers want to put all of this, all of the attention onto the patient, which is great. Um, but we really need to prioritize them as well. Making sure that they help you gather that information, that they understand their goals and values for your care, because that that might be important, especially if it's maybe a spouse or a child or a parent. Um, making a plan for themselves, recognizing um, changes in themselves, making sure they recharge their body, prioritize that self-care, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Same thing, knowing their workplace benefits, um, knowing when to share the care or when to delegate some things to other people, making sure that they take care of their health. Um, and then again, you don't have to do it all on your own. There are plenty of people out there. To um, so now understanding more the emotional changes that come with cancer. So of course we know physical changes come with this, um, but we don't always talk about more of the emotional sides of things. And, and we talked about them. So common worries are normal reactions to the roller coaster of the cancer experience. I think the roller coaster is a great metaphor for the cancer experience. Some, you know, sometimes it's smooth and things are okay. Sometimes it's chaotic. So recognizing that at some point you're probably going to experience stress. It's it's one of the only things in life you can guarantee you are going to experience is, is stress. Um, because there are a lot of stressful experiences with cancer. There's there's a lot of vulnerability, not just not just physical going to like you know the doctor and procedures and things like that, but emotional vulnerability of maybe sharing deep things with other people you've never talked about. Um, sadness, of course, the fear of a recurrence or cancer coming back, um, or even death, fear of dying. Of course, cancer um, forces us to face our mortality. Um, and then those problems can become far more disabling and become, um, you know, clinical depression or very high anxiety or panic. So these are important things to think about too. More information from the Cancer Experience Registry. Um, so about half of patients were at risk for clinically significant levels of anxiety. And, and what that means is basically everyone has anxiety and depression. That, that's a normal reaction to things that happen. But when we talk about something being clinically significant, essentially that means that it interferes with your day-to-day -day life. So whereas, you know, something happens, maybe you get fired from your job, you feel down depressed for you know, maybe maybe a couple days, you know, maybe you're still able to mosey on. Um, clinically significant would mean like I'm depressed for a whole month, I can't get out of bed, um, I don't want to do anything. So that that's what it means with clinically significant. Um, so... This is, I think, low for the depression. It says 38%. I feel like that's probably a little bit higher. Um, more than half worried about what's what's the future. I think especially in newly diagnosed, we, we don't know, right? We have no idea. We're given all this information and all these treatments and here's all these appointments. And then it's like, I, I don't know. I don't know what's 
Same thing with caregivers. Again, they experience uh, the emotional side effects of, of cancer too. So recognizing that in our caregivers as well. Um, so some common worries for caregivers, right? They were thrust into this caregiving role unexpectedly with no little to no preparation. Um, they may feel that they have to do these tasks alone. They may, they may fear losing you as well. They're, they're faced with your mortality. Um, they may have to juggle these caregiving duties with other activities. Maybe they have to work or maybe they have to take some responsibility over um, in the household. And maybe they feel inadequate too as a, as a caregiver. Maybe that they're not helping you as, as much as they could. So uncertainty. Um, many what ifs when it comes to cancer. What if the treatment doesn't work? What if the cancer comes back? And when we start asking that what if, um, and we have that uncertainty, our brain is wired to catastrophize because your brain is built for safety. Your brain really doesn't give a lick. If you're happy, um, if you're having a good time, it doesn't care. It wants to make sure that you are safe and that you will live so that you can continue on and you can procreate. That's what your brain does. So when we have this moment of uncertainty of, I don't know what the future holds, it will basically overcompensate and come up with the worst possible solution so that you will avoid that danger and stay safe. So thank you brain, not always conducive to help us live our life, especially during cancer. So speaking of control that we were talking about earlier, this can be a hard switch for our brain because your brain wants to control the outcome. It wants you to say, do this and your cancer will go away or do this and you won't be sick anymore. Do this and everything will be fine. We can't, we cannot control that. We can't just snap our fingers in that way. So we don't have control over what our treatment recommendations will be. We don't have control over the future. We can't, like I said, snap our fingers and make it happen. We don't have control over the diagnosis. It's there, nothing we can do about it. And we definitely can't control the responses of people around us. However, there are things that we can control that may lead to a more desirable outcome. So we can control how we take care of our health, which when we take care of our health, that tends to lead to more favorable treatment outcomes. We can control decisions that we make about our actions today. We can control our communication of feelings and needs, and we can control how we respond. So while no, that's not making sure that the future is stable or certain, it can definitely move us more towards that. So I think it's one of those counterintuitive things about life where when you let go of control, you have more control. Um, even saying that, you're probably like, that sounds really dumb, but it's true. Once you once you learn and let go of things you can't control, you'll find that you can a lot. Emotional first aid, this is great for anybody, not just us as patients, but even just if, if nothing else out of tonight you take from this, this is, a, is a, the basics, right? So first of all, finding some relaxation training. So cancer support community has um, um, a mindfulness, um, what, what is it called? Mindfulness, um, why can't I think of it? Relaxation visualization. Um, that they do every week that can help you with this relaxation training. They have other forms like yoga, things like that. Um, active coping. So the difference between active coping and passive coping, passive coping would be like watching a movie or binge watching Netflix or something like that, where you're kind of just checking out. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but too much of it can lead to avoidance. So active coping would be something that helps you process um, or express yourself. So this might be like journaling or talking to somebody or um, going to therapy, things like that. Reframing your thoughts. This can be a tough one to do. Um, I thought I had written down some examples, but I didn't. I think I was just thinking about them earlier. This can be a tough one to do because we can get into that positive toxicity is what I call it, um, kind of that good vibes only feel. We, we don't want that. We don't want the good vibes only. Um, we want to acknowledge when we feel sad, when we feel angry, all of those things. Um, a simple reframe can be, you know, this too shall pass, right? Like right now I'm really sad and it'll change. I might be more sad, but I might be less sad tomorrow. So reframing your thoughts can be very helpful, but it's a skill that you definitely have. 
maximizing that social support. We talked about that. Just, from, just remember that it needs to be truly supportive people. Um, if it's someone who's not supportive, minimize the time around that person. Acceptance and mindfulness. This is going to be related to the um, relaxation training. Um, acceptance of like, it is what it is. Acceptance doesn't mean that you have to like what you're accepting. So for example, you know, your diagnosis, you can be like, I don't like that I have cancer. I hate it. I accept it though. That's okay. You don't have to like it. And then mindfulness, which is just the act of being in the moment without judgments or expectations. So again, that kind of, it is what it is mentality. And then the last one, just setting an intention for self-care or time for yourself and, and start with something simple. Even if it's just creating a little morning routine where you get five minutes to sit at the table and drink your coffee or, you know, five minutes before bed to just listen to some calming music. Start to carve out that time for yourself as the chaos of life continues around you. Um, so to boil that down, some 10 living well tips. One step at a time, one decision at a time. Don't worry about something that's coming next week. It's next week. Nothing we can do about it. You got to worry about where you're at right now. Hope is, of course, possible, even in the darkest of times. Focus on nutrition and exercise. Now, this doesn't mean go to the gym five days a week, become a vegan. Just, you know, if it's as simple as I'm going to buy a bag of carrots at the grocery store and have them on hand, boom, there you go. I'm going to make sure that you know, on nice days like we had today, I'm going to go on a little walk, even if it's only 10 minutes or five minutes or 15 minutes. Um, just focus on that, those little changes. Reach out to others, um, especially others um, who have cancer as well, um, to find that support. It's great. Our loved ones can definitely support us. Um, sometimes, though, we need that sort of like um, camaraderie with, with um, people who are having a shared experience. So that could be through a group through cancer support community, or it could be just someone that you know. Along with that, ask for support and accept that help. This is very hard um, for people, but you, you're going to need it, um, and it's okay. People want to help you. They're not they're not laughing at you behind your back, or they're not going to think of you any different. As I said to you earlier, keep a notebook close for you to write down questions or thoughts or ideas, or put it in your phone. That's a great way technology can help us these days. Um, getting help from others besides your doctor, communicating effectively with your care team. One thing I didn't say earlier, um, I know at community we have my chart, and so you can send messages to your provider. So if you come up with, let's say you have 50 questions on your question list before your appointment, um, it can be nice to send that to them so they can look at it. You may prioritize maybe like three for when you're actually meeting with them that they'll answer for you. And then probably like your nurse or nurse navigator or, or patient navigator will answer the rest for you. Um, but using those communication tools to your advantage. Be your own best advocate. Again, this is your show. It's, you know, your, your insurance is paying the doctors. So you can ask them whatever you want to ask them. You know, be nice. Don't be mean. Don't tell them that Kyle told you to be mean. But, you know, if you're concerned about something, a side effect, ask them. Um, and then pay attention to what you need. You, you do need to know your needs in order to um, communicate them with others. So those are what I have for you tonight. The rest of this are just some um, cancer support community resources. Um, the Open to Options program is really great. I was a trainer for this when I um, worked at Cancer Support Community. It helps you to basically come up with a one-page question list um, that has all the information about your goals and your values for you to take to any appointment where you have to, to make a treatment decision, whether it's like, like your cancer treatment or changing a medication or anything like that. Um, so it can be, it can be, it's a great program. Um, the helpline, always you can call if you need anything, you call the helpline, they will help you find local resources. Um, the My Lifeline, I'm not as familiar with this one. I think this might have been added afterwards. Um, but I think it's a way for you to organize like appointments or um, like if you need help with rides or childcare, it's kind of like, a, I think it's almost like a Facebook, like you can have people sign up and you have like your little page and let's say you're like, oh, I need someone to pick Becky up from school on, you know, Tuesday, you can send it out there and someone will take it. So that can be a great way to keep in touch. Um, yeah.
Oh, that's a YouTube video. We'll skip that. You can watch that later. Um, any information you ever need about anything, you can contact Hunter. They have tons of educational resources, pamphlets, books, things like that. And then they may also even have some um, like education programs coming up. The Cancer Experience Registry, where you've seen a lot of this information coming from all the statistics, it's just a survey where they ask you about your cancer experience and then use that to help form not just stuff with Cancer Support Community and Gilda's Club, but also they use this for advocacy as far as laws um, and legislation too, so it's important. 